program to uh, upgrade and uh, take the health clinic to the next level. And uh, interesting, Linda and I go back to the 1990s when we both attended the monthly meetings of the cooperative group, uh, developed the studies I'm going to talk about today. First uh, disclosure, uh, I'm in the past two years have accepted honoraria from the American Academy of Child and Adolescence Society for leading psychopharm uh, seminars of the REACH Institute for Teaching Primary Care Practitioners and the Clemens Seaford Generation Foundation uh, for grants. I also am a, little, am a uh, contract doctor at the Kaiser Permanente now part-time and was a contract doctor at Laura Behavioral Health. Uh, I, the learning objectives were circulated in the email that um, I sent out. And primarily, <clears throat> we're going to look at two large scale, you know, on a national scale, multi site cooperative NIMH studies that were started almost 30 years ago to try and address the question which we get, I get all the time from parents. You say this treatment is effective. How long will my child have to be on the treatment? Is it for his or her own whole life? So to answer that question, at least partially, you have to know the outcome of the control phases of two trials for ADHD. And that's what I'm talking about, tension deficit hyperactivity disorder. One for school-aged children, ages 7 to 10, which is called the multiple treatment study of ADHD. And that was carried out at seven performance sites with 579 children. Uh, and another study that followed about uh, eight years later, the preschool ADHD treatment study, which looked at the safety and efficacy of stimulant medication in children with attention deficit disorder who were three and a half years old to five years old. Uh, and we're going to look at the control phase of those trials, and then we're going to look at the follow-up. And it's the follow-up that will address the question, how long does my child have to be on this medication his whole life? Now, these follow-up studies from the PATS, the School ADHD Treatment Study, or the MTA, fit right into a long tradition in child psychiatry of follow-up studies for children with ADHD as they grow up. As you know, this is a disorder that, until the last few years, has always been thought to start in childhood, and therefore it's a developmental disorder. And development is going on in these children in terms of their intellectual function, social functioning, self-regulation, and growth. So it's an opportunity to see what starts out as ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, where does it end up or lead to. And there have been studies in Canada, such as the one by uh, Lily Heckman and Gabby Weiss, uh, uh, Rachel Klein and Sal Medusa in New York City uh, now has up to age 40 in their New York longitudinal study. Russ Barkley uh, did a study of young men in Milwaukee starting at early adolescence and following them up into their uh, early adulthood. Uh, Terry Moffat um, uh, has been, has a large, and this is the only truly epidemiological study here where she's followed individuals from the time they were born until the uh, 30s. And then uh, Steve Hinshaw here in the Bay Area, of course, um, has contributed greatly with his longitudinal study of girls. And all these are published studies. In total, without going into the details, these studies suggest approximately half of the individuals diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in, in school age range will continue to meet criteria, especially the revised criteria of DSM for ADHD when they're adults. And interestingly enough, uh, the biggest problem for those individuals is not short attention span or jumpiness. It's the impairment that seems to come with this developmental disorder. Uh, lack of self-regulation, high levels of impulsivity, job changes, unstable relationships traffic uh, violations. They're all 
and uh, higher than usual incidence of uh, incarcerations, and in a number of the follow-up studies, a higher death rate than would be predicted for the age group for these individuals die. So let's talk about the first study. This was the largest clinical trial in the 1990s that NIH had ever done. And Peter Jensen organized this to address a public health question. At that time, there were clear treatments for potential deficit hyperactivity that had been shown in randomized controlled trials to work. One were the psychostimulants, and the other would be behavioral modification agency based programs. And yet, clinicians didn't know which treatment would work best for which child. Also, it wasn't clear if you combine the two treatments, whether they would do better than any treatment alone. So this study set out to look at whether or not carefully designed treatments would do better than individuals in the community uh, getting treatment as usual, and whether the combination did better than monoclonal treatments. So kids, 579 of them, we started off like 5,400 enrollees, but by the time they got through the process, we were 579. At, at that time, seven different sites uh, who were uh, randomized into four different groups. One was medication management, or of course, mostly stimulants. Second was behavioral modification, very intense program, well, some treatment program, regular meetings with the teacher, a 29 session parent training module, so the real Cadillac model. The combination of those two, and then there was a group fourth of the sample was totally evaluated, given the diagnosis, given the right of consent in the community to get treatment, with the idea that they would come back along with the others at three, at ba not only baseline, but three months, nine months, and 14 months. We would look at the treatment at that time. And you can see here that the design, and I want you to take away from this, it's a parallel design. They're just, once they're assigned, they stay in that group, and uh, it's an intent to treat model, which means that they will be analyzed, even if they switch treatments, they will be analyzed in the group they started. And the other thing I want you to observe is that um, we decided that uh, this was a this community comparison group was not enough to answer all our questions. So um, toward the uh, at the end of the trial, we went back to the classrooms where the kids came from and recruited 288 across all the sites, uh, children of the same age and gender who were classmates. And we didn't, we got, we did all the evaluations, but we didn't restrict the individuals, so we didn't keep out kids in psychiatric groups orders. We just took whoever was there. So these were hopefully through her variety of tests, it was clear that we got a relatively representative sample. Okay, the results. Now, this is the results of this study that was 14 months long. And the results all look like this. Now, these are, this is the analysis we did, and we'll hear more about this. It's random regression analysis. We used the SAS module called PropMix, and it's, it has a particular characteristic. Its statistic allows every individual who was randomized into the study to be analyzed at the end, regardless of what happened, even if they drop out at some certain point. So we were able to maintain all the numbers in each one of these groups, 145 groups. And the groups divided during the analysis, and this is one of the outcome measures, hyperactivity, impulsivity, symptoms, and attention to hyperactivity disorder. And the lower the curve, the more improvement there's been. So think of it as a symptom scale or a temperature. The lower you get, the more normal you are. The higher you are, the more uh, symptomatic you are. And you can see there are two families of curves, the upper set of curves and the lower set. The lower set are almost, in terms of parents, superposed. The lower set of the medications randomized to a medication condition, the two medication conditions. The upper set are either out in the community or on the behavioral modification. So that was like the first finding that uh, the treatments worked, but they were better when they were combined with medication. For uh, a group, the group of individuals was starting to treat children in Europe for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. 
the interpretation of this was start the parent training. If that doesn't work, it's okay to have medication. Um, and that was whether or not that influenced what was going on in Europe. Treatment of, in most countries in Europe for ADHD took off at about the same time as trial was going on. Uh, now, Steve Hinshaw and his had the researchers in his lab analyzed the data further. And they looked at factors, for example, what type of child would benefit? What are the characteristics of an ADHD child that makes them a good candidate for either behavioral modification or medication or combination? And they found that severity mattered, so less severe child with ADHD. The Children whose parents weren't depressed did much better than those where the parents were depressed. And if their IQs were normal or above, they did really well. Now, in addition, uh, there was another moderator, which is a uh, factor that a child has before starting the study. And that was if they had an anxiety disorder, they did much better on the combined treatment than they did on the other treatments or if they came from a lower socioeconomic status. So these were the moderators. There's a, another kind of factor, which is something changes during the trial after randomization. In this case, if the parents were able to complete a course on positive parenting, whereby they used, stopped using ineffective discipline or negative parent, their children's behavior ADHD symptoms and socialization scores in the classroom improved. It's one of the first demonstrations in a clinical trial of a change in one domain affecting the outcome in another domain. So it's felt to be a real strong and positive reason for including this kind of work in the future treatment to get back to it. Now, uh, we boil this down to try to put it in terms of a practitioner. So if a practitioner says, I hear kids did real well, some kids did real well in the MPA stuff. How, how many, what proportion of kids will walk in this office? That's sort of like evidence-based data when you talk about the number of individuals you need to treat before you see a really good response. So compared to treatment that's usual in the community, you do twice as well if you start the child with medication. So we had kids coming from the community treatment whatever they got, no treatment. About 25% of them improved. If they were, if they are on the other hand, were started on medication, 55% improved. And now let's say, what if I, in addition to medicine, I add behavioral modification. You get another 12% of improvement. So now two thirds of the kids are excellent responders. That means it doesn't mean just a little response. That means a response almost normalized that occurred to these kids. Now what about if they just, parents said, no, I'm going to never do stimulant medication on behavioral management. The uh, finding was that they did better, somewhat better. So instead of 25% response, they had about 32, 33% of kids who went into behavioral treatment uh, of the kind in the study got better. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only treatment. This is a very classic contingency management kind of treatment, and there are other kinds of treatments that come along. For example, parent-child interaction training, the triple P program for parent training that really emphasizes the positive parent that discipline, action kids be good. So sort of uh, with this kind of model, which I think you have here for PCIT, where uh, the therapist coaches the, the parent who's in another room through uh, uh, an ear or phone, uh, how to uh, interaction, you know, where interactions aren't working well. Now, that's the short-term study, 14 months, but that time was a long-term study. But that's the short-term study. So we got funding to have a longer-term study, just to give you an idea of the proportion. This, see the little bar at the bottom, that's the short-term study. We followed, that was like 1.2 years, we followed the individuals 16 years after baseline. So we followed the time they were uh, seven years old, the time they were around 23 years old for the youngest, 10 years old to 26 years old for the oldest. 
But what I'm going to be talking about are the findings out there at the Arrowhead, way down the road. And that's what we need to know to go back and answer that question. How long does my kid have to be on medication? Now, these were the early results. Well, this was the eight-year result, halfway there. Brooke Molina uh, analyzed the data, looking at a whole number of different factors, not just ADHD symptoms, but the kind of impairments kids get into in adolescence, like substance abuse, alcohol abuse, early sex, and so forth. And she found lots of impairments were starting to occur to the kids. But what was interesting is looking at the curves, you see that the curves separated for a while. That's the, that's the control study. But by six years, they all came together. So it didn't matter what group uh, you started off. You, you, the scores you got, the impairments you got were exactly the same. The risk for impairment were exactly the same. And just to compare to our classroom controls, see that little dashed line at the bottom, which is separate from all the curves? Those are the classroom controls on the same measures. As you can see, going down fewer symptoms, they were much less simple than the group. Now, the group, all the groups that started the MTA study did better by the time they were uh, even 36 months out. But they didn't do here anywhere near as well as the kids who were the normal controls. So we're seeing kind of this collapse of the differences. Uh, now looking ahead at age 26, Three, Lily Heckman evaluated the data and she found out that the persistence of ADHD was almost 50% in our sample. She had a good retention rate of 18%. Um, attrition by 16 years is very good. You don't get that except in really uh, very special studies. And so we maintained almost the entire sample. And the individuals who uh, who had the most difficulties with impairments were the ones who were continued and persisted in their ADHD. However, the ones who uh, didn't meet criteria for ADHD at age 23 still had their life impacted by having had ADHD. They had, they had uh, less post-secondary education, more job changes, more of them were on public assistance, more of them had, were involved in her, uh, risky sexual behavior, and they had greater emotional um, liability and really poor self-regulation. Okay, now, Jim Swanson became interested, I became interested to see if there were any long-term sequelae for medication. No, most of the side effects of the medications we were using. Predominantly, most of the sample was on nothing to me, at least. It started off on methamphetamine or rhythm. We knew that there would be some weight loss, maybe a little slowdown in the rate at which they gained height, um, might be some lack of appetite, um, some weight loss. But that was the immediate results of the treatment. So we all see we started some of the stimulants. What about 16 years later? Well, to get an idea of who took the medicine, because it was clear from all the regular interviews of the parents that only about 20% of the kids by the 16 years were still taking medication. We wanted to know whether they never took the medication very much, but they were given the medication, but they never did anything with it, and after the study, they just never went back to the doctor. We call that the negligible group. We wanted to know if they took it on and off, that was the inconsistent group. You want to know if it took it consistently. Well, the proportion, those are not evenly divided. Six, almost two-thirds of the sample were inconsistent. A little bit here, a little bit there, but they were all inconsistent. 25% never took the medication. And 9% took the medication regularly. And we looked at the amount of exposure that those individuals had. The group that was on no medication or negligible, they got, if you add up all the doses, you get something like 1,800 milligrams. The kids who were intermittently, where the parents said, 
on some visits they had been taking it the last six months, another visit, no, he hadn't been taking it, and then they returned. They, they, were, they had more lifetime exposure, 50, 55,000 milligrams. And the group that took it consistently, the small 9% sample, close to 100,000 milligrams of methamphetamine, total lifetime exposure. So there's a big difference in terms of the challenge that they've been given. And this was not orchestrated by the study. We were just passively looking at what was happening. Remember, after 14 months, we had nothing to say about the treatment. All the kids were no longer on protocol. We were just following. So we found, and I'm going to illustrate it now, differences in the trajectories of their growth. And interestingly enough, all these kids who lost weight, by the time they were adults, they not only were normal, but a number of them were obese. And this supports some of the findings separately from Sam Cortese, who's shown the 10% rate of obesity over the normal adults who have ADHD. So all these kids worry about skinny and not gaining weight. Something happens and they start, maybe it's a problem with self-regulation. I don't know what it is. It's an interesting finding that a lot more research needs to be done. So let's look at the growth rate in terms of, and these are all in terms of standard units of height. So it's not, these aren't inches or centimeters. These are a number of standard deviations. So we have the group that never took any medication. And then we have a group that was untreated. These are the controls. And you can see that the growth curve looks quite different. Uh, there is much greater difference between the time they started, stopped, and the negligible group. And the regular group is kind of flat. And uh, this really interested Jim Swanson because he wondered if untreated ADHD, so all the kids had to deal with was their disorder, not medicine, actually grew faster, had their growth spurt earlier, and although they didn't end up necessarily significantly taller, for a period of time around the growth spurt, they were growing faster and greater. Then we have the group being consistent. You can see that that curve just goes down. It's almost straight, straight or down. And then there's an interesting group, very small group of kids who entered the MTA study um, who got the medicine before. So we had a third of the kids come in the MTA study at age seven who had already been on medication. And they remained at a much lower level than even the kids on consistent medication. So having prior medication seemed to really be a risk factor. And that we don't know if that's because they started so young or if it was just a longer exposure. We can't calculate how much they got because we have no data on the dose or the duration of time they were on medication. So it would really be helpful to know that. We don't know that. Now, what about weight? Well. As you can see in the beginning, the curves do separate. There's a big drop in weight in some of the groups, and the consistent group goes way down. But by eight years, the weights are going up. And in fact, the group that spikes up, see this group of the second panel has BMI, the group that reaches the highest level is the consistently medicated. So it's kind of backwards. I mean, they're getting medication. Now, the reason the BMI is going up, because BMI is a combination of height and weight. So if your height is shorter and your weight is up, your BMIs can be much greater. So that's an artifact of being short, that the spike in 100 pounds on uh, someone who's 4'6 is got a higher BMI than 100 pounds on someone who's 5'6. So you get that kind of spikes. But just in terms of this, they're, they're about the same weight. So What's interesting is all these kids, when we worry about their weight, their weight's dropping off, the parents are saying they're not eating, and they're down a pound, and they're down two pounds. Um, they're going to have a different concern when they're in the 20s, which is the weight's going to be up. And it's almost a rebound. Now, this is not a surprise, because remember, stimulants started off as diet agents. And what happens, people took them for two or three months, the weight was down. And all of a sudden, they're living in the eat again, and the weight went up. So they take more stimulants, and then they get taller to that, the weight will keep going up. So it's a factor that we've seen in adults as well. So 
What we look for is we did, again, a multi-carrier uh, uh, mix model regression crop mix analysis of the data, looking at trajectories. And we look for main effects. That is, is there a difference in the curves? Um, you look at the curves all the way around, all, all along. And we found significant differences for main effects for height trajectories, which were significant. Of the compared controls. Um, and there was a barely significant difference. I know it looked very different, but when you take in the very small numbers that are involved, a somewhat a slight difference, all just significant for starting the medications before, way before you got at the FDA study. However, weight in BMI, there's no main effect. There's no main effect to being on medicine. To look over. And so our statistics weren't able to show that. There were lots of interactions that were significant, but the main effect wasn't there. So in terms of making these outcomes simple, um, MTA started off with lots of benefits, but they were gone by six years of follow-up. And they kids who had started on stimulants and then were put, you know, sent out to the community to get treatment. Um, they weren't doing any better than anyone else in the community. Now, we're, we're going to talk about how to interpret that, but clearly, and those kids who stayed on stimulants, yeah, they remained symptomatic, but they had a growth slowdown that persisted for 16 years. This is the ones with a very large um, total dose of methylphenidate over their lifetime. Now, let's move on to preschoolers. This is a picture of one of the preschoolers in our PAT study in a New York Times Magazine article by Gail Stolper on the challenges of doing a study of children with ADHD in the, pre the preschool years. And her article very nicely illustrated the ethics that were involved in trying and the kind of work that had to go into the IRB planning for this study in order to make sure these kids were protected from the risks of research. And, um, so, and I thought the article was very, very well done. I was a little cautious at the beginning of this. He is not always kind to um, PhD researchers, particularly in the New York Times, which she did wonderful job. Preschool study was launched. One thing that worked out going was an article by a pharmacoepidemiologist named Julie Zito, a very, very bright person, friend of mine, who analyzed large databases of medication prescription, uh, some of them Medicaid, uh, some of them state databases. And she found that it, it was published in JAMA in 2000, that up to 2% of the children in the medication databases who were under age six were on a med psychiatric medication. The majority of them are on stimulants. Well, first of all, the FDA doesn't approve methylphenidate being given to someone below the age of six. There were very little data on the safety or efficacy of methylphenidate. And uh, this became a big issue, public health issue. And in fact, the White House got involved. And we got something called the Hillary Amendment, which changed the design of the study. So the study be ethical. All the kids who came to the PAP study had to get parent training first, and only those who failed parent training could participate in the medication. This was carried out. The, the, the peak study was a three-year study. Left between 2001 and 2005, and then the follow-up was another six years. And the results of the immediate study were published in uh, JCAP in, in 2004, 2005. And the follow-up studies were published in 2013 and 2014, 2016, So this just indicates that we had to ignore, there were no rules about diagnosing ADHD kids who were under age six. They weren't in a formal grammar school program. So we made an inclusion criteria. They had to be in some kind of a group program. And that we had each child's data presented without the child's identity or which site they came from to a cross-site pattern for diagnosis. And all the kids, um, they were, families couldn't get into the study if the parents were bipolar. 
case, it was a concern that medication treatment might trigger romantic insulin. So this is just an idea. We recruited 303 children, and then we put them into a study. And after the parent, the parent training, uh, which was 10 weeks long, 165 were left to randomize into the titration trial. And this is the result. We found a dose response curve, just like we did at the MTA. So as the dose went up, the symptoms went down. And <clears throat> doses for the preschoolers were low. So the teachers began to detect the difference between placebo and active drug at 1.25 milligrams per dose. So that meant the smallest dose you can buy, Ritalin, is 5 milligrams. Total daily dose for those kids was under 4 milligrams. And then it got stronger as the doses went up. Uh, the children had um, also showed, as they did in the MTA during the study, a decrease in their growth percentiles and their BMI, just in that part. In conclusion, we felt that um, the benefit, there was some benefit, but it was smaller. Um, it's a smaller effect size. In the, those of you who know standardized clinical <clears throat> change in study, the large effect size is a powerful result, usually for drugs that work really strongly. Most drugs in psychiatry are in the moderate range, which is a, less than one standard deviation, usually about half standard deviation. In the fat study, we had a moderate effect size. In the MTA, we had a large effect size. The best dose, if you average it out for weight, <coughs> for the preschoolers, was 0.75 milligrams per day total daily dose. So the mean total dose for those kids was 14 milligrams a day. That was the optimal dose across the average optimal dose. In the MTA study, the mean dose was 32 milligrams a day and a higher uh, kilogram dose. The other thing we found is that these kids were less tolerant as preschoolers. So eight times as many kids had to discontinue and drop out of the study when given the medication as did the school age kids. And these children had the usual side effects we talked about, increased appetite, difficulty sleeping, but they also had more tantrums, less self-regulation, more lability, and much more irritability than the kids who were school age. And they did lose, um, during the period of time of the acute study, um, they grew one and a half centimeters less than expected and uh, 2.5 kilograms less than average. Now, what if, that's the acute study. So we see moderate effects, more side effects, and um, some growth suppression. So then six years later, articles began to be published about the follow-up. It's sort of the two-thirds rule for preschoolers. Two-thirds of them are still meeting pressure for ADHD. Two-thirds of them are still on medication, mostly stimulants alone. And those two-thirds aren't benefiting from the stimulants. So um, you can see that this is not a, as promising a situation as there are for school age. So let's look now back and look at why we should pay attention to these studies. What's different about these studies versus other studies? Well, the kids in these studies, both the school-aged kids and the preschoolers, are very well characterized. Many, many different examinations given. Um, the, uh, in more measures of um, parent, parenting, parent symptoms, parent functioning, um, child child socialization in the classroom, child symptoms in the classroom, impairments. Uh, and they're very well, very well characterized. And there are multiple uh, observations that were planned in advance of the study. Uh, in the MTA in particular, we had some idea of um, the kids in the community, uh, what they might be taking in terms of the medication and dose. We used a model, of an analytic model, that allows to contain most of the subjects who were coming in. And interestingly, in the MTA, we were able to look at two different effects. We could look at the effect of the disorder on growth without medication, and we could look at the effect of medication on uh, 
that uh, free of the effect of the disorder. Uh, so those things allowed us to kind of parse out what was going on. So for example, like I said, no medication. The children had a different growth trajectory when they had ADHD than the kids who were their class of control. We had a group um, that um, who were um, treated uh, given a negligible amount that allowed us to look at the effect of the disorder. And comparing the group that got stimulants regularly was the group that got never got stimulants allowed us to look at the effect on the of the medication. Not, not a lot of other studies. I mean, it's actually unethical to claim a study where you withhold treatment from an ADHD child for 16 years. So this was kind of like an experiment of nature. Now, that's interesting, but what are the limitations for our interpretation? Well, we can't determine the e efficacy of the treatment. There's no way, there are no controls. There's no one, and it's not ethical to have controls. We can't randomize someone to no treatment and then put the others on either behavioral modification or stimulus. It can't be done, not for 16 years. So we really don't know. These, we, are, we are surmising that the medications didn't work but we didn't have any control on the way the medications were taken. The doses that we required for them to be stated they were on medication were under 15 milligrams a day of methylphenidate. And from the MTA, the optimal average dose was 30 milligrams, so it was half the optimal dose. Uh, we know that there was attrition. There was, in this study, about 18%, about 30% of the past trial, and that lower sample size, lower power, we don't know what happened to the sample. The part of the sample we didn't collect. These individuals selected their own treatment, so there's clear selection bias is involved. We know it wasn't severity because when we looked at the kids who were, um, the kids who stayed on consistently were not the most severe who had come into the study. They were primarily parent, they were probably they were primarily children of parents who were college educated. That was the factor that was different, not, not the severity of their ADHD. And the adherence, which we based all this on, the exposure, is really based on parental recalls, you know, is not exactly the gold standard of data because it's affected by so many factors and uh, lots of forgettable. So Steve Henshaw really tried to grapple with this along with Gene Arnold. He wrote a really brilliant article I recommend it to everyone. Yeah, John Wiley and I saw it called, called Evidence Paradox and Challenge. And he noted that stimulants and behavioral modification of the MTA study works short term, but any benefits from that treatment in the long term are elusive. Uh, there's no persistence of benefits just what we think is a persistent effect of height, stimulant treatment, and the behavioral modification used in this study is not curative but palliative. And he concluded that either medication or behavioral modification that was delivered the MK is not enough to really treat children who need to work on skill building and positive habit forming approaches, need families to use positive parenting, and leave behind ineffective discipline and foster self-regulation in age-appropriate conferences. So let's talk, translate that into clinical recommendations. Right? We have these findings which are uh, have strengths and have lots of limitations. And they really don't differ a whole lot from what we're doing now. We're going to monitor height regularly. Of high height and weight. Height annually and weight each visit. Um, if you can, because we think that stimulants work for a while and then don't work, to test the efficacy of the stimulant by taking the child off of stimulants slowly, waiting a couple of weeks to make sure there's no rebound, and getting a reading, and start them on stimulants again and see if they return to their baseline or not. If they're not, then that was wait until they return to baseline. And I think that's what I tell parents now. I think 
we'll try it for a year or two, and we're going to test and see if it's still working. Maybe that means change to something else, but at least we we'll find out. Um, the intensity of this putative growth suppression seems to be related to exposure. Maybe. So go with the lowest dose you can, less exposure. The kids who begin treatment with stimulants before age seven are particularly risk for the growth slowdown. And this is the other thing which is probably new with this presentation. Following a child's weight is not going to predict whether or not they get height suppression. So you know after a while their weight's going to go up. Their height might not go up, but their weight will go up. And so giving them a PD sure or a all the chocolate bars each night is not going to avoid high suppression. It's just going to bring about the rebound. So what about the PAC study? Well, this is a little even more conservative. Uh, don't begin stimulants. It's not the first line treatment. Only begin them if parent training fails. That's it for the preschool. You've got to tell parents during their discussion that the methylphenidate treatment in their four-year-old, five-year-old, will that child will benefit less than he might if he were a school-aged child. That there will be decreases in weight, slow down in growth, and that children are much more sensitive at this age and will have to have side effects. Monitor the height every six months and wait each visit. And inform uh, them that this is a short-term treatment for see the benefits in the long term. This is, I want to thank the members of the MTA Steering Committee, which are my colleagues, Canada, United States, <coughs> Brazil, who are, we continue to meet on a monthly basis on the phone, uh, almost 30 years later, and we continue to work on papers. Some of the growth um, material I presented today is would be submitted as a paper for JCAP this month. And I do want to put in a plug for the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry that you heard by the president. There are two, two um, attempts during the next year that the Academy will make to, to carry out a top-level CME course. One will be at the meeting in Seattle next month. It's an institute, which is a full-day advanced psychopharm institute. And in particular, this one that's going to be in New York in January, they're going to talk about uh, early treatment intervention. When, what, and for how long. It's sort of what we're grappling with this talk. And the interesting chip with up, UCLA is going to be presenting that for ADHD, but it will be for all psychiatric disorders that start early in childhood. So I highly recommend it. Thank you. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll uh, take questions. Yes. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, one question that I get a lot from parents that, as far as I know, is inconsistent evidence in the research is whether or not stimulants or medication will prevent or promote substance abuse later in life. I'm wondering what your, if you get that, what your response to parents is about that question. And I think it's a very good question that's been debated ever since I got into the training uh, for a child psychiatrist. There was an early study that was that came out of Stanford by Dr. Lambert where she was concerned about a group of kids who had been diagnosed as hyperkinetic this was a long time ago and seemed to be more, it was uncontrolled, but there was a high rate of involvement with cocaine death um, at age 18. Um, there's been attempts to replicate that and with different substances. The only substance I know where there is clear evidence of increased, um, and it's not related to stimulants, um, is cigarette smoking. It's, once a teenager gets involved with nicotine and has ADHD, it's almost impossible for them to get off. Um, and also there's a, a, some of the follow-up studies have shown that children with ADHD 
are more apt to be involved with marijuana. Uh, uh, and then maybe go to gay drugs. So it's just a generalized increase in the risk for substance abuse. And there's some, some follow-up studies that, from Harvard that suggest that the kids who are in treatment compared to kids who aren't when they get middle adolescents are much less apt to be involved with substance use. Stimulants have been used in programs to try to treat adults with cocaine disorder. And um, Ryan Levin from Columbia published a study showing that I think it was considered given to individuals who were uh, cocaine abusers uh, made the length of time to relapse much longer so that they were helped by it. But I don't know of any evidence, and, and as far as alcohol is concerned, it doesn't seem to matter. Studies of Bill Pellum and C. Hosa have shown that treatment uh, with stimulants doesn't seem to have an effect on uh, kids the age at which they start abusing alcohol and what they abuse in service. So my statement is that uh, I don't think there's been any proof, good proof that stood the test of time with stimulants sensitize anybody to taking um, illicit substances when they're a teenager. That was a big concern. Uh, and there's some anecdotal evidence uh, that needs to be replicated from the partner group that is protected. So we tell parents that the jury's out, but it doesn't look worse. Maybe better. Yes? In the past study, how well did the peer training work and did that affect the treatment? The question is, in the past study, how well did parent training work and did that affect improvement? Uh, well, it's a complicated answer. Uh, the By the criteria of 25% decrease in ADHD symptoms, 19% of the individuals entering the parent training Hope program check Chuck Cunningham uh, did better. However, a number of parents felt different after the parent training program, felt empowered. And even though the child didn't do better, they felt they'd like to spend more time doing parent training. So we had quite a few, maybe double that number, who didn't want to go on to medication because they were enlightened by the parent training. And that would be kind of a good argument for the parent training as a screen because uh, if parents adopt more positive parenting, less ineffective discipline, um, and get some, there's some hope, uh, I would stick with those parents to make sure that they've exhausted everything before turning to medication. So see why it's complicated. A small group got better, but a big group of parents said, no, I don't have They came in statement they did, but turned it down. So we had uh, approximately half the group get through to the trial. Yes? So that that's actually interesting because the data that, that Bill Pelham has published looking at sequencing and finding that the sequence of medication first prior to parent training that decreases uptake of parent training by parents who've had their kids medicated first. So that's just sort of interesting implications for sequencing. But the other thing that I was wondering about this, and I'm not sure whether, you all, whether this is published or not. So, you know, the six-year outcomes are kind of discouraging, right? Yes. <laughs> um, but there was a group that had, you know, that they were identified as being excellent responders immediately after treatment. So was there any difference in trajectories for kids that say somehow were normalized following the treatment? In terms of, so it all... No. Do you, you mean the growth trajectories now, right? I'm, I'm just, no, I'm talking about the, um, or the symptom. symptom outcomes. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing if you separate by the kids who no longer meet right. criteria, if the ones, because you could make the argument that they were on different trajectories to begin with if one was going to resolve, but like, so do, are the treatment effects different in the kids who no longer meet criteria than the ones who do? It's interesting because there was a paper, and I direct suggest you look at that. It's also JCAP, who did a latency uh, uh, tendency and analysis 
to look at if there were any individuals who uh, pulled, the groups pulled apart in terms of the way they were symptomatic. And uh, there was a group that did better, much better. But it didn't seem to be related to treatment. The, the dose of medication or adherence to medication didn't, didn't have them separate. Uh, they were less severe to start with, but uh, there were other factors not treated. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could comment on, I think there was a paper that came out this week on the long-term effects of stimulant medication and increased risk of Parkinson's symptoms. Where, I'm not familiar with the paper. Where was it published? Okay, I cannot off the top of my head. It, I think it was just this week, um, so I didn't you know, anybody had a chance. Uh, the dopamine system is definitely involved in stimulant medication. So uh, it would be interesting to see if any individuals are showing Parkinson's symptoms. What's the relationship to the treatment? I'll try, to, I'll try to find it in All right. I'll look at it. That's a good point. You should look at it. Yes. You have mentioned a group of people with undiagnosed ADHD, and I would be interested in hearing more about re your recommendations on that group. Let's say they're coming to the teenager years or even as young adults. Some of them, for example, start to self medicate with cannabis, and it can be beneficial. Others may want to turn to the medication. Others may already have the skills to basically sustain as an adult without the medication, what would be your recommendation, recommendation there? Like, should it go in direction of medication at some point if they realize they have an ADHD, or is it really individual that you say? There's a group, a group I was talking about, maybe different than what you're describing, mm -hmm. but I was talking about there's a group that had met criteria for ADHD. Okay. By the time they got to be 23, they didn't meet criteria. Okay. And they had fewer, they were sub thresholds because they didn't meet five criteria. They might have been four. But the symptoms, the impairment was really bad for those individuals. It's not that they didn't have symptoms, they just didn't meet the APA's diagnostic criteria. The other thing you should know is that there's a whole series of, there are a number of studies they're coming up with some interesting findings, both the Deneen study and also the longitudinal study. When they look at individuals who meet criteria for ADHD as adults, not all of them had ADHD as children. So in their control groups, they've got kids who were, they were evaluated, they didn't have, didn't have ADHD. So now they have ADHD. In fact, the majority, the majority of ADHD adults in the Deneen study, 90% of them didn't have ADHD as children. So was this big flap, is ADHD uh, just a child disorder or can it come on after childhood? And there are all kinds of artifacts in terms of getting ratings from individuals who are ADHD, getting ratings from others, you know, on their parents, and are they, are, are these individuals self-diagnosing and coming in and so it's a very confusing situation. I would stay tuned for this. These are careful researchers who are reporting this, and so I really want to know more. We did not, in the MTA study, there weren't anyone, there wasn't a one that converted to um, ADHD. And by the way, Captain Gallagher and Peter Jensen, using this data from the MTA, showed that None of the individuals who had the premonitory symptoms of bipolar disorder and met some of the criteria but not all couldn't get anything with bipolar disorder. But that's at age seven. Those individuals, when they took stimulants, improved in their bipolar symptoms. They didn't, it didn't trigger a panic episode. And, uh, so that's interesting because that's what some of the data is beginning to suggest. That's not something that would happen. Well, our time has expired, so thank you very much. Thank you. Very, 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 very.